The 2023 general elections may have ended in Nigeria, with the winners also emerging. But the race to the nation's biggest political office may just be taking its next turn. Presidential candidate of the Labour Party, Peter Obi, and candidate of the main opposition party, the People's Democratic Party, Atiku Abubakar, have called for the nullification of the victory of President-elect Bola Ahmed Tinubu of the ruling All Progressives Congress, Obi and Atiku, in their application claim that Tinubu is unqualified to run for the presidency and should not have been on the ballot. Conversations around the veracity of Tinubu's victory are currently ongoing around the country, with most concerned parties already setting up their legal teams. The coming weeks hold a lot as another Nigerian election is contested in court. As we keep our fingers crossed, we also unpack these issues and developments after the 2023 elections. Now, joining me to discuss the legal ramifications of this petition, I have Festos Oguz, a legal practitioner, who joins me uh, from Lagos, Nigeria. A warm welcome to you, uh, Festus. Thanks for joining us on PHQ. Thank you very much for having me. Now, Festus, in your opinion, what is the significance of the recent petitions filed by Peter Obi, Atiku Bubaka, Action Alliance and Allied People's Movement, challenging the outcome of the presidential election in Nigeria? Well, it shows clearly, without uh, any out of doubt, that the election conducted by INEC leaves a lot to be desired. From issues relating to systemic disenfranchisement of our people, to late arrivals of material, malfunctioning or non-functioning of beavers, and in some cases, gross issues of violence, rigging, voter suppression, and ballot stuffing, intimidation here and there, it shows clearly that the election was marred by irregularities. It shows clearly that the election seemed not to have reflected the, will, the wishes and aspiration of our people. And that is why, because of the inefficiency and the irregularity that marred the uh, conduct of the election in the past weeks, we see that uh, our people are, are now taking the, their dissatisfaction to the tribunal. And as far as I'm concerned, I think they have good cause to have approached the tribunal. The reason being that the irregularities are so substantial that they cannot be left ignored. The, no. Yes. Presidential candidate of Labour Party, Mr. Peter Obi, has approached the tribunal on three major grounds. Yeah, One, and, and that brings me to this question, uh, Festus. Uh, can you explain the legal grounds on which the petitioners are challenging uh, the election results? And uh, what's the likelihood that the tribunal will rule in their favour? And when I talk about the grounds, uh, do the three uh, or the four uh, petitioners have the same grounds and in what cases are they similar and in what cases do they differ? Will they be looked at, at as individual cases or they'll uh, be looked at as a group petition? Well, uh, I have seen the petition and I've equally read the petition filed by the Labour Party. I've also seen the petition and I've also read a petition filed by the People's Democratic Party and its presidential candidate, al Hajia Atiku Abubakar. I can see a sort of similarity in their reliefs, and I can equally see some sort of similarities in their grounds. The two parties have insisted that the, the president-elect is not qualified to contest for the office of the president. They have equally maintained that the election conducted by INET 
was marred by corrupt practices and non-compliance with the Electoral Act. They have equally maintained that Ashwa Yubola Ahmed Tinubu was not elected by the majority of the lawful vote cast. There are issues relating to the failure of beavers. They both raise issues relating to the failure of beavers. They have equally raised very sensitive issues of overvoting in some of the states of the Federation. The two parties have equally raised very significant issues, very controversial issues, as to whether a presidential, a person who is to be returned as a presidential, uh, you know, as a president, has to win at least 25% in the FCT, regardless of whether mm. he has won some other parts of the country. But, you know, uh, looking at it here and there, I think uh, the decision is for the tribunal to make because no matter how beautiful the petition is drafted, you equally need to support this petition by credible, cogent, and irresistible evidence at the tribunal. So it is too early to call on whether the suit or whether the petition will see the light of the day or otherwise. Fine, I have looked at it, good grounds, you know, challenging the election, but they have to cross that hurdle of evidential body. They have to prove at times beyond reasonable doubt where there are elements of crime, and they have to equally prove, you know, on the balance of probability, reasonably, that there has been substantial non compliance with the Electoral Act, there has been substantial overvoting. And the failure and re failure of uh, the beavers and the failure to upload results results on IREF has substantially affected the results of the election. And on the issue of uh, whether the matter should be held together, yes. Mm. When we talk about consolidation in our court, we are not just saying that uh, the matter because the matter is similar, they usually, because the matter is similar, the issues raised are similar they will be heard usually side by side. It's at the discretion of the court to hear the matter side by side. But beyond all that, they have to establish their cases separately. So they have to call their witnesses that will, and their witnesses that will you know, give testimony in support of their cases separately and differently. So these are the issues. I, I have not <clears throat> seen that of APM and Action Alliance. I have not seen their petition. Okay. I have not read their petition. But now, first I can tell you categorically, yes. I can what? tell you categorically, as a matter of fact, within my personal knowledge, that the petitions in court are not business as usual. The one I have seen are not business as usual. Okay. I'm now, um, Festus, one the reason why we're here in the first place, why these petitions went to the electoral tribunal, is because of a lack of trust in the electoral process and INEX conduct. Of this election. So even if, I mean, on the condition, it's a conditional statement, if uh, the elections are cancelled and you have to still do another election, it will still be INEC. Now, what steps can be taken to improve the transparency and credibility of Nigeria's electoral process and prevent allegations of election fraud and irregularities in the future? Because well, the, the, courts, the, the court's business is not to conduct elections. The courts are there uh, for the issues. You, I, agree, I agree with you in total that it is not the duty of our court or the duty of our tribunal to conduct elections. It is not their duty. Their duty is to interpret laws and ensure that you know, everyone gets justice. But because of the failure, gross failure of our electoral system, with the business has not been turned to them, now we, are, we now have to repose all our trust in our courts because you must not forget that there is what we call the doctrine of presumption of innocence under our extant laws in favor of INEC. That means whatever INEC has done is presumed to be regular unless you prove otherwise at the tribunal. And that places a very heavy body on the part of the petitioner. But beyond all of this, I think the fundamental challenge is 
that we have a set of people you know, in, the, in critical positions in this country who are not committed to free, free, and credible elections. Look at what happened in Ogun State, for example. Look at what happened in Ogun State. The law is clear beyond paradventure that when the margin of victory is less than the number of votes in areas where elections were canceled, the election must be declared inconclusive. That was not done in Ogun State when the case was, uh, when, that, when that was the case. But that was done in Adabawa State, and that was equally done in Kebi State. They mm. declared the election inconclusive in Kebi and Adabawa State. But when we got to Ogun State, IDEC said no, they are not going to do the same. So it looks to me that, it seems to me that, look, we have a system, we have a law, with a set of legislation that, you know, bring about a reasonable framework for the conduct of free, free, and credible election in Nigeria. But the set of individuals who man critical positions in this area seem not to be truly committed to, to the constitutional mandate of which, which is clearly written so, in black and white. Yes. Yes, which is to conduct free, fair, and credible election in this country. Look at, take for ex example, the issue of beavers and uploading on IREF. The INEC chairman made it abundantly clear to our people that the election results will be uploaded in real time. He made it clear to us. He made a promise, not once, not twice. Uh, Mr. Festus Okoye, the, the spokesperson of the commission, equally made it clear to our people that, look, the results of the election will be uploaded mm -hmm. As the polling unit in real time, it is also contained in the regulation made by INEC. Yet, the election's results were not uploaded in real time. If you look at Mr. Peter Obi's petition, they made it clear that even as at the time of filing that petition, that was two days ago or thereabouts, the results are still being uploaded. The election that was conducted in Ogun State last week, uh, Saturday, we still have, as at this morning, results are still being uploaded. The results were not uploaded in real time. So the essence of uploading the results in real time has mm -hmm. been defeated. defeated. And INEC is not even making any effort to amend or to correct all this anomaly. I respectfully think that for us to move forward as a team, we need to even change the process of appointing whosoever will lead INEC. It shouldn't come from the president. That's where the reform should start from. And that comes from mm -hmm. the constitutional amendment. You cannot have a city president who is a member of a political party nominating to us who would who will conduct the election. It was president, the president renominated the INEC chairman. So that shows you that there is a force in there. It shouldn't be the president that would that would uh, and it does question the independence and in the INEC that it's not yes, really it's a, 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 it's independent. Now, now moving on, uh, Festus, the election petition tribunal has never overturned a presidential election in the history of Nigeria. We've seen uh, state gubernatorial elections overturned. Uh, that's why we have staggered elections and off-cycle elections in some states of the Federation. Now, if the election petition tribunal nullifies uh, Ashwaju Tinubu's victory, what are the possible implications for Nigeria's political landscape? And could it impact the credibility of future elections? You see, the, the Electoral Act 2022 has brought a lot of radical changes to our law. And with the Electoral Act 2022, I wouldn't be surprised, I would not be shocked if the presidential election is upturned or we have the court declaring another person as the president or things in that direction. Why? Before now, for example, before you can prove overvoting in an area, even if the overvoting is manifestly clear, you need to call witnesses from each polling unit where the overvoting is alleged to have occurred. That is no longer compulsory under the new Electoral Act 2022. So that has changed the jurisprudence in that respect. What makes it difficult usually for election matters 
to be properly litigated or successfully litigated as a petitioner is because it takes a whole lot to prove this allegation. You have mm. to call a, and a person from each polling unit. If you call a person from a, a ward to come and testify what happened in the polling unit, they will tell you, oh, no, it's the SC. So the new electoral act has changed the game. It has made it easier for those who have suffered injustice, electoral injustice, to get justice. And that means that with documents in your hands that can manifestly show that they are non-compliance with the electoral, they are overvoting and the rest of these corrupt practices, you are good to go. So I am confident that our judiciary, I am confident that our judiciary will do the needful. I'm confident that our judiciary would ensure justice. And you know, the our courts are not just court of justice, it's also a court of uh, public opinion. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy you uh, mentioned that. And uh, still putting the spotlight on the Nigerian judiciary. The judiciary is often described as the last hope of a common man. Can you discuss the role of the judiciary in ensuring fair and transparent elections in Nigeria? And how can this role be strengthened? Earlier, we did talk about uh, the judiciary not being INEC, that it's not its responsibility to conduct elections. But how can this same judiciary ensure a fair and transparent uh, electioneering process in Nigeria? Well, I do not have any doubts in my mind that the Nigerian judiciary will deliver its mandate under the Constitution to our people. We cannot preempt the court. But I am confident again, I say, that once the parties, particularly the petitioner, can sufficiently support their case with cogent, credible, and irresistible evidence, the judiciary is left with no other option than to interpret the laws vis-a-vis -vis the evidence at the disposal. Yes, I can understand the fear of our people that, oh, uh, we have issues of corruption, we have issues of bribery in our judiciary. They are there, no doubt. They are there. We've had cases where judges have been retired for taking bribes. We have cases where lawyers have been, you know, the rope for, you know, trying to manipulate the judicial system. But then, there is hope. Because in this country, we've seen cases where a supposed person who has lost an election gets to win the election later. I do. I, I still want to encourage our people to be hopeful. While there might be inadequacies here and there, I still encourage our people to see the, our judiciary not as the lost hope of the common man, but as the last hope of our, our mm. people. Now, first, this, um, the petitioners, as we've been discussing earlier, have alleged that the election was invalid by reason of corrupt practices and non-compliance with the provision of the Electoral Act uh, 2022. Uh, you did uh, mention some examples. Uh, can you provide specific examples of these alleged irregularities? And from the tribunal's point of view, uh, does it matter how many times uh, it occurred and the volume of these uh, irregularities? What would they be looking at for? Thank you. Now, there is you see, election petition, election matters are so generic. They are of their own kind. They are special and require special speciality and expertise. When we talk about non-compliance with the Electoral Act, we are not just saying that, oh, when you complain that there is no compliance in an area, that is enough to obtain the victory. The question that must be asked and that must be answered in the affirmative is whether the non-compliance is substantial enough to affect the return of the person who was declared winner. So the, the test is whether the non-compliance is substantial. And I will explain. How do you determine if the non-compliance is substantial? You determine if the, if the non-compliance is substantial if the if Without the non-compliance, the person who is complaining would have won. Mm. That means if I allege 
that there has been overvoting in my polling unit. And so the court should have turned the election. Yes, I have the good ground to go to the tribunal because I saw, uh, uh, as a candidate, I have seen that there was irregularity in my polling unit. Now, the question the court will ask is, is this irregularity or non-compliance substantial? How would the court arrive at the answer to that question? The court will get if it's substantial, if I can prove that assuming we have 1,000 difference or 1,000 margin of victory, that means we have 1,000 margin of victory between the, the declared winner and the runner. -up. I am saying that, well, if the votes or the number of voters in my in my area, in the area where the election was cancelled as a result of irregularity, or where the irregularity of court was cancelled, if those elections in those places were cancelled, then the person who was elected should not have been elected. Because mm. once we prove that there is irregularity in those areas, uh, there should be a cancellation of the votes in there. So what okay. I'm saying, how you how you get substantial irregularity is that, well, if I had conducted the election in this area, would it have, if the election in that polling unit had been equally occurred or conducted, would it have affected the result of the winner? Let's say the winner has 100 votes as a margin. Yes. In the polling unit where irregularities are alleged, there were just 50 registered voters. It won't be in that case, that, that, that non-compliance or irregularity in that place is not substantial. Mm. Because when you remove 50 for 100, we still have 50. Now, quickly, so before we wrap up our conversation, Festus, uh, and uh, I would appreciate if you could do this in less than two minutes because we're fast uh, running out of time. What does the defense uh, team do in this situation? Are the lawyers of the APC, what's your role? What would they be doing at the tribunal? And finally, what lessons can be learned from this election and the ongoing legal battle? And what reforms are needed to ensure a credible and transparent electoral process in Nigeria? Uh, I think that um, the duty of the defense is to defend the, the president-elect and the political party. It is also the duty of INEC to defend themselves. But, you know, it's going to be a difficult one, particularly for INEC, because he that comes with equity must do so with clean hands. Hmm. But I will leave the rest for the for the tribunal and our courts to decide. Okay. Well, the, the lessons I think we should take from all this is that we still have a long way to go in our country. Look, it is getting better. I can tell you for a fact. It is getting better. Our democracy is improving. We are getting better. However, what was conducted the last time as election by INEC leaves a lot to be desired. And one of the radical reforms that we need in this country is to change radically the mode of appointing the leadership of INEC. INEC. We need, a, we need a, another route of you know, appointing those that will man INEC. Because okay. INEC ought really to be independent. And Thank, not, you. Uh, on Thank you very much, uh, Barrister Festus Ogunz. It's been an absolute pleasure having you at Politics Headquarters today. Thank you for your time and contribution. Thank you for having me. You're watching PHQ on New Central Television.